Hi, and welcome to Danny After Dark. If you're new here, make sure to like and subscribe so you don't miss a notification or a new episode. Tonight, I'll be featuring the case of Melissa Drexler, also known as Prom Mom. So I do have to say, I am really excited to talk about this case with you guys. This has been the first case that I posted on the Danny After Dark Instagram account where my DMs blew up, like within minutes, blew up. And you guys were not shy about your opinions on Melissa. So I'm very excited to talk about it with you guys. And some of you, I'm guessing maybe haven't heard of the case. So that's going to be really interesting to see how you guys react to it because it's one of those cases that dare i say disclaimer disclaimer on this episode because it's it's a big one so let's see who's here and who's going to be subjected to listening to this case <laughs> hey james well you know what i'm glad after you realized there was a mishap in the name in your mind that you still decided to stay and give the episode a chance so thank you james hey kane Paul Cass. Paul, I warned you. I warned you about this case. So I'm just saying, don't come crying. Oh my God. Kane. I know. I know. Oh my God. We'll get to it. We'll get to it. But yes. Let's see. Corey Novak. Welcome. How you doing, ma'am? David Ellis. Hey, Auntie Mimi. Good to see you. Thank you. I purposely picked the shirt for this episode because I was just like, no cleavage, no nothing tonight. It just, it's one of those cases. It just, it needs, I needed a wholesome look just for myself to process this. So yeah. Hey, we have someone new tonight. Mr. Beckham, welcome to my channel. Yeah. Good to see you. While you're here, hon, uh, be a doll and get me a coffee, please. Corey Novak says, hey, Mimi, watched that video of you on the Paul cast recently. Cool stuff. Well, Corey, one, there's, th she was here three times, not just one. So it sounds like you still have some more content to get through, hun. But yes, for those who don't know what Corey is referring to, uh, my Auntie Mimi and my Uncle Ken had appeared over on the Paul cast channel where I'm a co-host over there and did three amazing amazing interviews and if you missed it check it out i can't even sum my summing it up would be just not even doing it justice so go over there and check that out and yeah get a little bit of insight into what my aunt and uncle you know do it's yeah it's wild so let's see i think there are three of them Corey. there see james James, you know, I knew I kept you around for something. If it was to correct everybody else except the mistakes you make in your not, uh, mind, thinking tonight's episode didn't say prom mom, it will, it's okay. It's okay. Oh, thank you, Israel. Not a dress, just a shirt, but thank you, thank you. The one with your, oh, the haunted mansion. The SK Pierce haunted mansion, yes. That yeah, when Mr. Beckham comes out to visit, we're going up to the haunted mansion. So yeah, for anybody who's in Massachusetts, head over to the SK Pierce Haunted Mansion in Gardner, Massachusetts, to see all the all the hard work that's there. And it is haunted. So yeah, check it out. And it is very, you know, there is quite a list from what um Aunt Jamie was saying about people wanting to reserve to stay there. What was it like being like a two-year waiting list or something for people who wanted to stay the night? Which is wild. Wild. Let's see. One of my first ever lives here was a Mimi episode. <gasps> James, I didn't know that. That's oh my god, that like, oh. I love that. James, I love that. Hey, Firefly, good to see you. I'm like kind of like putting off the inevitable of talking about this case with you guys. I kind of went back and forth on like, should I cover this? Should I not? But I really wanted to cover it. So 
Yeah. And doing, it's like I knew quite a bit about the case, but when you deep dive into like the little, little details of a case, it, it's always just that much more gut wrenching. So again, disclaimer on this episode, I I've done my part. Paul cast leave, please leave. Cause you're not going to like it. So yeah. Yes. I have been to the Lizzie Borden house. I actually hadn't been my entire life and went, which blows my mind because it's just in Fall River. I went during the kind of, I hate this. Okay. When I say tail end of the pandemic, I feel like that's different for everywhere in not only just the States, but the world. But when things started to reopen again with the pandemic, I went and you still had to wear a mask, which was fine. You could take as many pictures as you wanted. You just couldn't take video, which I was kind of bummed because some people had asked me, please take video. And I couldn't, but it was really cool. I, to be <laughs> where the crimes happened and to like stand in those spots was very surreal. And it's one of those, everybody has heard of Lizzie Borden, but like everything that's just like when face value is just like bullshit. So you have to actually like, research the case and then you hear oh no she was actually acquitted oh no she actually lived the rest of her life in fall river and grew old there and path like it's just there's so much more that when you think of the rhyme and all that people don't think of that and i'm not just saying it just to you kane because th there's just so so much about that case but if anybody lives in massachusetts or is coming to visit you know fall river is a bit out of the way but it's certainly worth a visit and you can actually stay over there i wanted to stay over there but it didn't work out, but I was so ready to stay over because I just, I wanted to see, wanted to see if anything would happen, if I could hear something and, but no, didn't happen. But there's a really cute black cat that lives on the property. So of course, like right away, I was just like, okay, I'm here for the, for the Lizzie Borden house, but oh my God, there's a cat. Speaking of that, I know it's case night and typically the cats are not all in, loud in the room. But I made an exception because he looked so cute sleeping. I didn't want to disturb him. But Loki is, he's all black, so he just blends right in. But he's in the cat tower sleeping right now. So if he gets up and stretches at any point, there is a cat in the room. But that's the only one. So Danny brings an axe when she visits it. I mean, I can't confirm or deny. Hey, Paul, good to see you. Okay. All right. We're over seven minutes in. We got to get to it. This is a bit of a shorter case note case because you'll see why. You'll see why. But I'm sure there'll be a lot to talk about during it. So let's go ahead and find out more. Let's go ahead and dive on in. Melissa Drexler was born on July 10th, 1978. She attended Lacey Township High School in New Jersey. She had a boyfriend, John T. Lewis Jr., as an 18-year-old senior in high school. And as most 18-year-olds do, and seniors, of course, she looked forward to her prom. Again, as most girls do their age, they dream about their high school senior prom. However, on the prom night, June 6, 1997, not 77, big difference, June 6, 1997, the prom night took a tragic turn. So, Melissa had actually delivered a baby in the restroom stall at her high school prom and then threw the body in the trash before returning to the dance floor. The shocking thing, nobody knew that Melissa was pregnant, not her friends, not her family, and most importantly, not even her boyfriend knew. Of course, over the nine months, she was able to keep her pregnancy a secret from everybody. She was five foot seven inches and weighed only 130 pounds. Physically, again, she did not appear pregnant at all. On the night of the senior prom, Melissa's water broke that morning. She later suffered cramps on her way to the banquet hall. However, she was not going to miss her prom. Once she arrived, she just simply excused herself to go to the ladies room. She delivered a baby in a bathroom stall about 20 to 30 minutes later. I just want to add a side note here. There are some articles that say she delivered the baby within 15 minutes. 
However, most research articles say that it's between 20 and 30. So I'm kind of go going to go with that time frame because that seems to be the one that is most well documented. But there have been some that do say she delivered the baby within just 15 minutes. So before we carry on with that details, I just want to give a quick look at the chat and see how you guys are holding up so far because I kind of just jumped right in with that one. So the horror show channel. Hi, good to see you. Oh, I don't have. All right. All right. We need to give you a wrench. So I typically don't have YouTube pulled up. So let me just pull it up so I can give you a wrench because there are people in here that are wrench happy and they will knock you out or time you out just because they're mean. <laughs> James Watson. So hi, Cecil. Good to see you. All right, let me give you a wrench, add moderator. All right, you should be all set there. Thank you. Okay. James says that's not very classy. She should have at least been. James, you can't say that. You can't say that. And James, no, the, the picture that I put as the thumbnail for this is actual footage of her walking into the prom. So... Again, it's a very, the angle isn't great, but she just, on first glance, looks like your average 18-year-old girl going to prom. Let's see. Yeah, Kate, James is horrible. He is horrible. He was great in putting Corey in his place earlier, but now he just backtracked a little with that comment. But let's continue. So... What we learned was that Melissa cut the umbilical cord by dislodging a metal container that was meant for sanitary napkins from the wall in the bathroom stall. She severed the cord with the container's serrated edge. She then wrapped the baby in several garbage bags and then disposed of the baby in a trash can. And what did she do after? She simply went right back into the prom and on the dance floor and she joined her boyfriend and friends. According to student witnesses, she, quote, appeared to be just as she always was, end quote, and, quote, exhibited indications of somebody enjoying the prom, end quote. Other students stated that she had eaten a salad and just danced the rest of the night. While a janitor had received reports of blood in the restroom, they noticed that the trash bag weighed more than it should. So they searched the bag. That is when the baby was discovered. Teachers approached the girls who had been in the bathroom during the night to ask them about all that blood that was in that bathroom stall. Melissa, when asked, she initially denied giving birth. She stated she was having a, quote, heavy menstrual flow, end quote. All right, girls. Come on. Come on. We all see through that bullshit. Because if you see documentaries on this, they're, no, 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 Melissa, don't try to do that. Don't try to do that. All right. After it was known that a baby's body had been found, Melissa, she did confess to the teachers that she had given birth. The autopsy determined that the baby was born alive. Melissa then choked the baby and smothered him with her hands or with the plastic bag. Melissa was subsequently charged with murder. She pled guilty to aggravated manslaughter. The prosecutors obviously were going with the strategy and the story that she knew what she did and she purposely killed her child. The defense was going, was really trying to prove, well, how do we know that the baby wasn't born alive? How do we know that the baby didn't stop breathing at some point? They were really trying to go with any angle that they could essentially to help their client. The defense was doing what they should be doing to help their client. But again, a lot of theories. And with a newborn that was only alive, if we're going that route, maybe a few minutes, it's it was a very, very difficult time to really pin down what truly exactly happened. But so before we jump into Melissa in court, let's see what you guys are saying. 
It was a dig at Leslie Van Houten. Leave Leslie. Leslie has nothing to do with this one. Leave Leslie alone. Let her live. Let her live. Girls as in James. I don't know what you're referring to, but that's okay. All right. So Melissa, while she was in court, read this statement. Quote, I knew I was pregnant. I concealed the pregnancy from everyone. On the morning of the prom, my water broke. While I was in the car on the way to prom, I began to have cramps. When I went to the prom and I went into the bathroom, I delivered the baby. The baby was born alive. I knowingly took the baby out of the toilet and wrapped a series of garbage bags around the baby. I then placed the baby in another garbage bag, knotted it closed, and threw it in the trash can. I was aware of what I was doing at the time when I placed the baby in the bag. And I was further aware that what I did was would most certainly result in the death of the baby, end quote. All right, you guys, that is a loaded, loaded statement. But what stands out to you guys with that? There are a few things that initially really stand out to me. Notice she never says, she never puts hum, a human touch to the baby. It is always instead of my baby or him, it's the baby. She constantly says the baby. And another thing that she said, which to me was even more telling, was the statement, I then placed the baby in another garbage bag, knotted it, and threw it in the trash can. She's implying about the trash bag, obviously, but the statement threw it in the trash can. You're throwing your child in the trash can. And she uses the word it. That whole statement, there's so much distance between what she's talking. She's admitting, she's admitting, but there's such a level of space between herself and the reality of what happened. The words, again, this was a prepared statement. This was not something that she just came up with on the fly. So she had time to prepare this. And she would have had the time to put a human touch to it. And she didn't. And that says so much. We could analyze that all day. But that's what I took from it was just the real disconnect, the really big disconnect between herself and the baby. Literally, her saying over and over again, the baby. Wild. Paul says, what a sad case. Absolutely. We're not done, though. We are not done. We're getting there. But we're, yeah. Kane says, yes, sad. Yeah. Wow. Awful. Mm-hmm. Indeed. Yep. Yes, ma'am. Was there any idea what she would have done if she hadn't given it? Give... No, James, there isn't. There isn't. There was nothing that I read. And if you think about it, would you even believe what the answer would have been? Because it's so easy. Anybody could just say, well, yeah, I would have done this or I would have done that. And think about it. This was 1997. So this wasn't, for example, you know, 50, 60 years ago where times were so much different, you know, back then, and there was, there's so many resources where she could have turned to surrender and she chose not to. And that speaks volumes. It really, really does. But no, technically I don't, I don't have that answer. I wonder how she treated her dolls as a child. I couldn't, that's an interesting question. I didn't, there was not a lot that I could find kind of pre-prom, but then again, she was so young. It's not like we're talking about somebody who, uh, and that makes sense, right? We're not talking about somebody who was say in their fifties or sixties by the time these acts were committed or brought to life where there was a whole life to look through. You know, she just was a school kid, but there was nothing that I saw indicating any level of, violence towards inanimate objects, towards animals, um, other people, classmates, etc. There was nothing that I could find of that. Star Trekker. I have not seen you in some time, Star Trekker. So good to see you. For that answer, 
stay tuned for when I do cover the case of Ted Bundy. I actually expect you to be front and center watching when I do get to covering that case. Um, but I hope you're good, doing good, Tracker. Good to see you. Hopefully she didn't treat her dolls like the little girls at the beginning of the Barbie movie. Oh my, I was waiting. I was waiting when, right when you first said that, I was like, someone's going to bring up Barbie. And of course it was you. I actually saw the Barbie movie. I jumped on the bandwagon. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to lie. Had no plans to, and then it just kind of fell into place and that's what life is, right? All right. So where we left off in the case was Melissa gave her statement about, quote, the baby, end quote. Having trouble on my end here. In regards to what, Kane, I do have YouTube pulled up like another screen and I don't see that on Blurry or anything. So maybe it might be your connection. I'm not sure. But anybody else, let me know. Put it in the chat if you're having problems as well with the stream. All right. So Melissa, again, she admitted guilt. Let's just pull that up. Yes. So she pled guilty to aggravated manslaughter. She read her statement. So on October 29th, 1998, she was sentenced to 15 years in prison. This was the maximum penalty that the judge could give. November 26, 2001, Melissa was released on parole. So three years later, three, she was sentenced to 15. She was released three years later. She ended up serving, again, just a little over the three-year mark. She went back home to live with her parents. She was noted to be a model prisoner and took fashion courses while in prison with the hopes of working in the industry. Well, where is Melissa Drexler today? She is now married and a mother of two children. That is the case of Melissa Drexler, also known as Prom Mom. So what do you guys think about this case? What are your opinions on this case? Y'all certainly had a ton because when I posted what the subject was, the case I was covering, you guys blew up my DMs, which has never happened quite like this. So what do you guys think? I will say that I don't typically during the uh, case when I put the notes together, I don't ever mention that when cases are cited in kind of pop culture, in the media, this case was actually, someone actually mentioned it to me today. Wasn't that the case that was on, you know, such and such a program? And I'm like, yeah, that was, that was the case. So if you know, you know, again, you can easily, I hate Wikipedia. I hate Wikipedia, but you could always go there and it will tell you what show that this was referenced. In. And it was vet done I know it was meant to be comical, but I think it was extremely distasteful. But yeah, that should that should be that of kind of where it's referenced in pop culture. Like so many cases are, and I hate that, hate that, hate that. But yeah, this the ending of this case, you can look up where you can look up where she, what she looks like now. And yeah, she's according to her social media, which you can find, she is hoping for a third child. So yeah, very interesting. Very interesting. And I know people will have a lot of opinions on that because it's not exactly similar to the uh, Ken and Barbie case. Oh God, of course referencing now after the Barbie movie came out. But Car point, uh, person that I'm referencing is Carla Homolka. You know, what she did with her to his sister Tammy and then she got out got married, married her lawyer's brother, and went on to have kids. I know this is different, but to me, this is more shocking because she did this to her own baby and now went on to have more kids with somebody. And I know a huge part of what society would think now is I feel like it's very split. Some people think that's awful. She shouldn't have her own, you know, she has kids now. Think of what she did to her first. And then there'll be a whole other slew of people that say she was 18. She was a kid herself. She made a bad choice. She's allowed to grow. 
rehabilitate as our prison system has tried to explain that we do over and over and let her move on and grow in life. So I see both sides of the token, but when you first hear that, it's a little, it's a little shocking because of what we know happened and she admitted what happened. So let's see what you guys say. What a twist at the end. Absolutely. Absolutely. She should have had to have her tubes tied as part of her parole. You know, James, you're clearly from another country by saying that. And I know you mean it as a joke, but it's, I get what you're, I get the reference that you're saying in that. It's, it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. That's what it is. Uh, let's see. Ouch. Mm -hmm. uh, well said. Well said. It's a disorder where they feel that nothing is real. Like they're in a dream. I forget what it's called. I don't know the term you're saying, but I'm sure if it was to pop up, I'd be like, oh, right. Duh, that. Did she go to her high school reunion? You know, James with the hard hitting questions. I don't know. I'd like to think no, but I mean, does anybody really go to their high school reunions? I don't know. Maybe it's just me. I don't know. My thought is, you know, especially nowadays with the world of social media, it's like you talk to who you want to talk to the rest. Do you really care and just how are you? Oh, great. Yeah, we should get together. Okay. Yeah, no, I have no intention of ever speaking to you ever again. That's how I view reunions. But that's just me. So, yeah, that case. I'd kind of be more interested what you guys think about the her statement. I think what was said and what was not said to me, just like, that's what I gravitate towards is like just picking that apart because again, it was a prepared statement. So it could have been worded much with much more empathy, much more compassion, but it wasn't. So that's kind of what I, uh, let's see. Uh, Corey says depersonalization disorder, baby. Undercover Mermaid says, just, I, I knew I was going to mess it up. Disassociative disorder. Let's see. I know legally they couldn't, but more. Well, James, if we're going by, more, if we looked at every case and thought, you know what, legally this probably isn't right, but morally, my God, there'd be no one left in the world. Not saying I don't, with certain cases, I don't think, man, if only the judge could have done so on and so forth. Not saying this one, but there are many others, right? How do you classify her crime? Oh, that's so tough because who made the, who made the question earlier? And I said that it wasn't necessarily you know, it's one of those after the fact, had it been a different day that she went into labor, would that have made the difference? Again, we can't do the what ifs, what ifs. So with that being said, in, if I was to, if I was to play that game, I really think the outcome would not have been that different. I don't think she would have. I think she purposely tried to conceal this in every way she performed to everybody in her life. And I don't think in her mind, if she had went to like a you know fire station to drop off the child, a hospital, you know, some type of agency where she could have surrendered even for adoption. She was so young. And I know people can argue 18 is a legal adult and they're right. But 18, you know, when you're when you're that age, you think you're on top of the world. But looking back, it's like, you know, 18, you're still a child. You're still a child. And I don't think she had the wherewithal to be. I don't think she fully thought what the long term repercussions of this. I think she thought she wouldn't get caught. I really think she wouldn't have gotten caught. Think of. 
Okay. I don't have kids myself. So, okay. Disclaimer. I, I know when babies are born, they can weigh, you know, the weight of the baby can be totally different. It could be you know, only what, six or seven pounds, or it could be a larger baby, maybe 10, 11, you know, 10 or more pounds. I don't know the weight of the baby that was not said in any of the research that I did. So I wonder, I just wonder what something tipped off, obviously the weight of the bag, but then again, you know, at a function, it really should only be what paper towels and some other girl stuff. But imagine if the custodians did not stop to, to make that next step of, you know what, this is a little heavy. They could have just cleaned up and moved on. If they did, no one would have known. And that is what's so tragic in all of this is all it took was somebody to just question, you know what, something's not right here and make that next step. And that is so beyond commendable because we see so many cases where someone questions something and they just, they either try to rationalize it in their head or don't want to make that next step and just, oh, you know, it's, let's just keep moving forward. The fact that the custodian thought enough to say something's not right here, let me examine. Holy shit. Yeah. Long story short, I still don't even think I answered your question, Israel. It's hard. I think it was, I'm torn. I'm torn between her making it, I know this isn't the right term, but like a crime of opportunity where it happened in this moment. So she took the only option that she saw versus if she gave birth two days later and she was somewhere else. I don't know. I don't know. And the sad thing is there was no research that I found where she had the, had any other plan of anything. It was, yes, I knew I was pregnant. Yes, I concealed it from anybody or sorry, from everybody. But then what? But then what? What was your what was your plan? So with her not saying there was a plan, I do in my and this is just speculation. This is just conjecture. My own thoughts on this. I think the outcome would have been the same regardless of wherever she was, whatever situation she was in. I think she really was going to hide this any way that she could, which is just tragic because this was 97. This was 1997. There would have been so many opportunities to surrender the child, but she chose not to. Let's see. That's a good option, better than what she did. Mm -hmm. Did she bind herself to hide the pregnancy? Maybe the baby was already harmed. See, and that's something we're not going to know. Um, yeah, exactly. Fire stations. I was in, well, I'm in Salem like multiple times a day, or sorry, multiple times a week anyway, but I happened to be at a red light in Salem when I was leaving the city this past weekend. And I was at a red light. One of the fire stations in Salem was like just right at my side. And a few of them were outside talking. So of course I'm just like, oh, okay. And they have like a giant sticker right on there. And I forget the wording, what it was, but it, it basically indicated that it's a, drop, a safe drop off space. If somebody wants to surrender a baby, I'm blanking what it said. It was like one or two words, but I just like, I know that they're posted on fire stations. I just have to ever just have the time to just sit and look. But again, I was at a red light and just kind of noticed and was like, oh, okay. So it's very, it, it's clear. And she would have had that option, but she chose not to. Sorry to jump back to James's question. So obviously the baby had no type of prenatal care and we don't know. For, I There was not enough follow-up from the autopsy to determine, you know, were the organs fully developed as they should to a baby being born. There's that was not, if it was done, I did not see the report that said that. So we don't know, but we can't, I try not to think about that because, because then it just kind of leads into the defense, what the defense could say, well, well, maybe see this baby might've been born too early or you know, wasn't fully developed. Therefore there would have been 
cognitive disabilities or, you know, physical and, you know, disabilities, so on and so forth. So I don't, I try to even think that route, but I get exactly what you're saying in that, James. So yeah, this is one of those cases. And I just want to say that as much as there's quite a bit of very unspoken, I'm trying to soften it, but based on the TMs, like there's really no way to soften it. The amount of anger and just calling it what it is, hatred towards Melissa and the crime that she committed. There's so much with that. And I totally get where the public's coming from that. Totally get that. There's also on the flip side, a lot of people that have some compassion for her, not excusing what she did, not saying that it was right, but some, some compassion because she was essentially a child herself, didn't know what to, clearly didn't have a plan and made a monumental, horrible decision. But again, the U S justice system and criminal justice system says reform, reform, reform. She was a model prisoner. She took courses. I don't agree that she should have gotten out within three years. I think that's extremely lenient. I mean, even the math of good behavior, that just doesn't make sense. That just doesn't make sense to me, but it is what it is. And yeah, she moved right back in with her parents. So that's that. So, all right, you guys, thank you for sticking around for another episode of Danny After Dark. Uh, let's see. Oh, a couple of quick questions. Okay. I don't want to go. Hey, Capone, you're at work right now. Oh, that sucks. Yeah. Watch it later. Watch it later. No rush. Have a good rest of your night or evening at work. Um, what about the afterbirth, the placenta? I don't know. I don't know. All right, you guys, any other questions or comments on this, feel free to leave it in the chat. Otherwise, of course, feel free once the video is just up on YouTube, feel free to continue the conversation there. Or if you're catching this and it wasn't live, post your questions, comments, opinions on this case. You know, let me know what you guys think. Again, what I kind of really focused in on is her statement, her statement in court. And that's, again, what was said and what was not said to me spoke huge volumes. But anyway, all right, everybody, enjoy the rest of your night. I will not be doing a true crime in chill later this week because I'm actually going away on vacation. And then I'll be back close to mid next week. So I got to figure out what my schedule next week will be. You guys will see me live for sure at some point next week. I just don't know if I'll just jump into like the end of the week with a true crime and chill. Another one, um, just to make up for the one I didn't do this week. We'll see. We'll see. But follow me on Danny After Dark on Instagram. And yeah, you'll get to see a little bit into my vacation. And maybe you'll see some familiar faces on my trip. Maybe. Maybe. I don't know. All right, everybody, have a good night. And remember, we don't live in darkness. Darkness lives in us. Bye, everyone.